Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. Real Estate Coaching Radio is the nation's number one daily radio show for realtors who demand authentic, real-time coaching. Get ready for fluff-free, unfiltered, full-strength honesty about what's truly working to get you into action, helping others, and making money now in today's real estate market. Now to our hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. Podcast listeners, I have some a huge surprise for all of you. I have what I will argue is the nation's number one luxury real estate agent, though he's going to correct me as soon as he starts talking, Robert Johnson <laughs> from Greenwich, Connecticut. He's not only a personal coaching client, but he's also actually one of those rare coaching clients that becomes friends. Really a wonderful, wonderful guy. I've been looking forward to this interview. I've been telling you guys about it for the past uh, couple weeks. What Robert and I are going to do on this podcast is we're going to deep dive into what it truly takes to sell some of the most expensive real estate on the face of the earth. We're also going to be talking about uh, pricing. We're going to be talking about what it's like to sell the most expensive real estate on the face of the earth in an extreme buyer's market. We're going to talk about things at a level that many of you have never been exposed to. I want you to get ready to listen to this and then maybe listen to it again and again and again. Rob, Rob and I had a call last week where we were preparing for this because we wanted to leave uh, nothing on the field for the sake of really disseminating the best possible information we can. So, Robert Johnson, without any further delay, welcome to today's podcast. Thanks, Tim. I don't know where to go with that introduction. You're absolutely right. You know me. <laughs> you know me well enough. So, thank you. That's a very generous me. introduction. Yes, Rob's a very humble guy, and so he doesn't like to brag about his success. That's the thing about Rob that makes him probably so successful is the fact that he does have a lot of genuine humility. Rob, can you give them a little bit of background on? who you are, how long you've been um, – I mean, you've been in the real uh, – let me just get you started so you can skip the real basic stuff. Rob's been in the real estate business in various capacities for most of his adult life. So he's always been doing something, investing or you know, buying real estate himself. He's one of these guys that's been um, – you know, came to selling resale uh, real estate as a natural extension of what he'd been doing all along as a part-time job or as a part-time, I think, passion aside from uh, working on Wall Street. So you can pick it up from there. Yeah, so my first career, which most agents um, have, obviously, um, was on Wall Street, and that lasted around 17 or 18 years. During that time, I was investing in some um, in some spec projects and investment um, things. I worked with a high end, very high end custom builder um, as I was tra- transitioning out of Wall Street, and then very quickly turned to being a realtor, realtor full time after that. So full full time as an agent, it's been around six years, but my exposure to real estate obviously predates that. Right. So your background on Wall Street um, was on the tra- on a trading floor. We don't have to get in the weeds about what you did. But did that? Right. Were there any par- were there any parallels between what you did on Wall Street and selling real estate? Yeah, um, I think communication, um, having um, getting people information accurately and quickly is always helpful. I think one of the, um, I think ninety percent of the time, if I take. A, um, a listing second third fourth um, then the number one complaint is um, is communication from the previous mm-hmm. owners uh, from the owner's previous experience so that's definitely helped me with that I think you um, I think I had to be responsive to a pretty a pretty demanding audience um, before in that career and that has translated well into servicing clients and giving them a um, a a full experience um, as a customer on real estate. And, I, th- and I, I think it was a couple of years ago that you and I last spoke about how, that, um, how important that is um, in, the, in the high end, whether you're in a soft market or a, or a, a more bullish market. But um, that's definitely, I, th- I think that's the, um, the single most important thing. Right. Furiously fast lead follow-up is just part of it. You're talking about constant, uh, constant communication. And I want to drill down on that since that is really the, you know, guys, at the end of the day, that's the secret sauce to being a successful listing agent is your ability to communicate. Rob said this little – he said this statistic really quick. I hope you caught that. The number one complaint that people in general have about their agents after doing a transaction is lack of communication. But guess what, guys? Um, when you start speaking with sellers, even if it's not an expired seller, just sellers in general – uh, you know, you're going on a listing interview, you have to have uh, the expectation that they're going to have had a bad experience with an agent because of their lack of communication. So if you 
cover that objection even before the seller gets to say it through your pre-listing pack, you're going to be just absolutely miles ahead of your competitors because that is the number one problem that people have. So let's talk, I'm going to talk to you about something specific because this is another thing that I think has gotten bastardized over the years. You directly communicate with your sellers. You don't do it through assistance. I mean, obviously, you have uh, – you, well, okay, let's start out there. Well, do you we do have both. A team? So, okay. N- no, not in, the, not in the way that a lot of agents say um, a, a team. So um, I have two people um, – two great people on the payroll, one who is responsible more for marketing and client. the client contact there is um, through, um, through what we do for them um, with marketing on a regular basis. And then I have um, another lady that works for me um, that helps m- more with showings and, and, the, and the listing management. But what that does is helps me, it frees me up for delegating certain things and concentrating on selling. So it helps me grow my business, not um, not create a team per se. Um, and I think that's another thing going back to uh, people that have transitioned from a business environment, whether it's me or any other agent. If they, um, I think people with that background are more willing to spend on their business rather than see every dollar that is spent as uh, money out of their pocket. Um, I think people that have owned or run successful businesses before tend to feel like that's more of an investment in their business rather than, um, rather than a cost. Well, do, uh, do ultra luxury – well, so guys, just to put this in perspective, uh, Rob's going to sell, I don't know, between 130 and maybe as much as $150 million of real estate himself this year. Well, by, by himself, I mean he's the one doing the transactions. He's got probably one of the sweetest, smartest um, – you know, uh, I don't want to call her an assistant, really, but Lisa is fantastic, and, she, and that's the extent of it. And, and if you look at the models for most of the ultra high-end agents in the country, if you guys are ever blessed enough to come in contact with someone like Rob Johnson, you're going to see that what they don't do is talk about their teams. You're going to quickly learn the reason why is because high-end and ultra high-end folks do not want to even remotely feel like they're being delegated. And as soon as they do, no. or as soon as they get a whiff of it, you're fired. Well, drill down on that. And that's what we talked about. Well, yeah, and we talk, I remember talking about this a couple of years ago with you on the, on the I think it was at least two years ago on the, on the last time I was on the show. And I think a parallel is, um, especially the higher up you go, there's a service industry that is specifically uh, caters to um, to a um, to the luxury market and to the ultra high net worth, um, and every other part of their world is a, is a very high level of service. So if you can't provide, and real estate shouldn't be any different. I think um, I think it has been, um, and I think the level of service that people get in that um, at that price point is is not the same as it is in say the financial services industry um, or um, or a luxury car market or whatever whatever someone is wanting to spend their um spend their money on um there in my mind there's a discrepancy between um with a lot of agents with what they get um as a service in real estate versus the rest of their lives so i think if you come below that you're going to be um you're going to come under the gun right so when someone does business with you they're getting you is, is is that something you have to tell the the prospective sellers do you do you make that clear to them that when they hire you they well, get you a lot you? of people are they, they're, they're, they bring it up often before. Um, there you go. It's not really me bringing it up. It, it comes up. So if, if there's a perception, it'll come up in a couple of different ways. So if you're um, – one of the questions that I might get asked is, if, do, you have too much, do you have too many listings? And that question really is, have you got enough time for me, obviously? Um, so that's, that's when you explain where, where, where the uh, team element is to, is to help me – still prioritize their uh, their home um, but it's um, yeah you have to assure people that you have enough time um, enough time for them right and so the key thing is and also you are in situations sometimes where you don't want to take every listing you turn listing opportunities down you're very particular um, about which sellers you'll do business with because you know Greenwich Connecticut like the back of your hand and if you guys have never been to uh, Greenwich, Connecticut before. It's probably one of the most beautiful little hamlets that I've ever seen. And for you guys to, uh, it's, it's difficult to put it in perspective what it's like to live in Greenwich, Connecticut, but you're dealing with, 
you know, pretty much wall-to-wall multimillionaires and billionaires. Rob touched on something. You guys should Google this if you're not familiar with it. There's great reports that come out of the financial industries that talk about high net worth and ultra high net worth folks and just all kinds of really cool facts and statistics and everything from about, you know, their lifestyles, the homes they, you know, how many homes they own, where they're buying real estate, even down to what types of cars they they purchase and all that type of thing. Um, and so if you're going to really, if you're thinking about really having this be part of your future, selling, you know, truly um, high-end real estate, and I'm not just talking about a high-end middle-class home. I'm talking about things that are absolute estates, the types of things that people drive by and, you know, take pictures of when they're in different communities. That's what Rob sells. Um, there's only probably and, a couple and, of them. Uh, are- well, it's just to st- step in there and, and correct you a little bit. So the – the town, the size of the town is around 70,000 people, um, and we're under an hour, just under an hour from, from New York. So it's um, a lot of people work in the city. Um, there's, a lot, there's a reasonable amount of international money, a reasonable amount of inherited wealth, um, and real business owners as well. So it's actually a more diverse town than a lot of people perceive it as. Um, you're a lot of outsiders' perception is the drive-by large mansions, um, but it, the town runs a, a very broad range. So, for example, in the last 12 months, my deal range has gone from 900,000 to 48 million. So it's not all um, it's not all the mega mansions, um, but it's it, 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 it is actually a broader uh, it's a broader market than a lot of people imagine. Absolutely, and of course, you realize for most of the country, 900,000 would be considered ultra high end, right? <laughs> It, it can be, and and so the, our our market is obviously different. Like every 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 market all over the country is different. And the LA, I'm not that I not that I'm knowledgeable about the LA market, but the LA luxury market and the and the and the Greenwich luxury market will have different idiosyncrasies about them. Not all um, not all luxury markets behave the same. I think there are a lot of parallels, but it's it's um, market knowledge um, in. Niche market knowledge is 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 key for every agent. It doesn't matter where you are, whether it's you know, whether you're in uh, Houston, LA, Greenwich, um, or Manhattan. How do you get that knowledge? There, How would you suggest an agent get that knowledge? But well, by li- just I mean, the only way you can do it is by living and working in it. So, um, and that's what people are coming to you for when they come when they um, engage you as an agent. If you're you know if you're if you're representing a buyer. They, they. That's what they're paying for. They're not paying for you to pick them up from the station and just drive you around. They can get any old um, Tom, Dick, or Harry to do that. But the, they want to know, um, they want to know which area is going to be um, create more value, which is more prized, which is more exclusive, what what's going to trade at a discount, um, which um, which houses are sold off the market, which are available off the market. Um, that's, those are the sort of things that are value added for, um, for, um, buyer representation. There's a different, um, on the sell on the sell side, it, it could be, um, it could be a different set of criteria, which involves service, um, dollar spend on marketing, again, market knowledge, um, and perhaps having a direct, um, knowledge of who's, uh, which buyers are out there looking for their property before it um, before it hits the market. So, um, three deals that I've had this year uh, have been off the market, um, and that's probably pretty consistent with maybe three out of 20 deals um, on a you know on a year-to-year basis. A couple in the fours, and one very expensive one at 48. So, um, sourcing, um, being in touch with your market on a day-to-day basis is is helpful for um for listing and buyers let's talk about what's actually happening in greenwich and this is what you and i were talking about um last week which i had to go over with you three or four times just because i thought it was so fascinating so tell tell them about what's happening in the marketplace and then um concisely and then let's drill down and talk about uh, essentially the psychology of the sellers and the buyers because you've been in a protracted buyer's market on the ultra high end. And I think for most people listening, they are going to be blown away by how different um, real estate markets can be. The difference in, you know, all that's interesting. So tell them a little bit about what's going on in Greenwich, Connecticut and how long it's been going on. So I would say the, going back to the downturn in 08, 09, if we use, use that as a, as, as kind of a, a line in the sand, um, I would say there is, and 
and this is this goes back to what you were just saying about knowing your market. And um, but what's been happening here is um, a protracted buyer's market, um, which is very difficult to navigate for buyers and sellers because it's not um, it's not consistent. So in a town of, as I said, seventy thousand people, there are there are um, locations and types of houses that are that have um, been very weak, and some have um, some have actually retained their value. Um, a lot more. So I would say there are parts of town where since 08, 09, the market is flat um, and I've sold a couple of my listings for slightly more than they would have traded for or did trade for in 07, 08. Um, and I've had um, transactions that are um, that were up to 40, 50% off where they would have been in around 05, 06, 07, 08. So it, it runs a very broad range, which is confusing for um, it's confusing for sellers and it's confusing for buyers as well. But there's, there are three or four different reasons for that. Um, I would say, in general, there has been a shift in, in people's tastes um, and what they want in houses. Less people want um, – there, there are a certain amount of buyers that still want very large houses, but there are less of them. Um, I think there are people's tastes have changed towards being nearer um, urban areas. So – um, a convenience um, a convenience preference has, has changed in the last 10 years. I'd say there's a political element to people's decisions and buying and selling in, in Connecticut. Um, tax laws are continually changing on a local and national level, um, and those have impacted us for negative reasons and positive as well. So without, you know, without going into a 10 minute description of those there, there, there's a political um, there's a political climate that's both positive and negative um, I would say also because of where we are we're pretty correlated towards Wall Street employment and the absolute number of people employed in Wall Street since 08 09 and uh, increased amount of regulation um, has dropped so depending on um, whether which part of Wall Street you work in um, whether you're an equities guy or a bond guy or a private equity guy there are there are all sorts of idiosyncrasies within those businesses, uh, but net net, there are less people making significant amount of money than there were, to, to put it in a nutshell. And that that that's one of the core drivers for our middle to upper end of the market. So you pull that away, um, and you're going to have a protracted amount of weakness, and that's what that's what we're seeing. There are other towns near near us um, that are luxury markets that are more correlated to. Greenwich uh, to uh, Wall Street money, and they've seen significant um, weakness as well, more more than Greenwich. But um, there are three or four different factors at play that have um, that have made it tough sledding, and it's definitely a um, it's definitely a buyer's market for most of the town, but not all of it. And 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 helping people through that, buyers and sellers, um, is is um, is hard. Well, so let's here's the here's the sort of the mindset that. It was interesting to talk with you about last week. You've got buyers that are purchasing. Listeners, listen to my question. You've got buyers that are purchasing houses in Greenwich, Connecticut, knowing that they won't make any money, and most likely it's entirely possible they'll lose money, and yet they're still buying houses. And the reason I'm asking that question is because most agents listening, Rob, as I'm sure you know, have absolutely no clue how to sell a house to a buyer <laughs> that when the market isn't always on the ascension. And but as soon as you take away the, you know, the, the fear of loss uh, angle, if you don't buy it, somebody else will. That's essentially how most agents, that's the only way they know how to get contracts signed. Um, you can't say that because it's not really, I mean, yes, that's true. Somebody else might, but buyers are, it's a totally different approach. So why would someone buy a house when they had a, when there's a high likelihood that they were going to lose money, and if if not just break even on the house, even after years. Well, um, well, a couple of reasons. Um, they our largest buyer base would, and, and it depends on the price as well. So I would say up to three million. Um, most of the buyers um, that I see um, on either side of a transaction need a place to live. So it tends to be a need up to about three million, and their uh, their need is reasonably immediate. They want to um, or, or have to choose the best value they can within probably a 30 to 120 day time horizon. So they're they're real shoppers. Um, you get above that price point, and it tends to become more discretionary, um, especially above four million. No one 
needs to live in a $4 million house or a $10 million house. It's more of a discretionary purchase. And I would say that people's outlook on those um, buys are, are different from the 2 to $3 million buys um, for most of the time. Um, so and so let, let, me, if, let me interject, if, Rob. You just said it right there. You said something really important. I hope they got it. So listeners, he's, the reason that people buy houses in a buyer's market and even in his price range, I know some of you are saying you wish your meat and potatoes price range was two to three million, but the reality of it is, is that people still need a neighborhood to raise their family. They still want to have be close to the amenities. They still want to be close to good schools. They still want to da 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 da. So the mindset shifts that many of you are going to painfully experience, unfortunately, is learning how to basically sell real estate not as a winning lottery ticket or not as, you know, if you don't buy it, 10 other people will, but you're going to have to wrap your mind around the idea that selling real estate is essentially, you know, people buy homes to live in. That's the primary. And, and, um, uh, yes, go ahead. Well, and the financial elements that you, you were asking about, um, if you, you need somewhere to live, what's your other choice? You can, you, you can rent. So is renting a house for between 10 and 20,000 a month over two years, there's that calculation to work out. Um, but what really gets the buyers comfortable, and this is what makes a weak market more, pro, more protracted, especially at the higher end, is the buyer is going to want to feel that they're, if they think that their prognosis for the market is flat to slightly weak, um, or even more negative than that, they're going, they're going to want to feel like they're buying with a cushion on the downside. So um, if they think um, the house is worth $4 million today with another buyer, they're, they're going to want to buy it for three and a half to to give themselves some insulation. So it becomes a, a self-fulfilling prof prophecy on that market being weak. So that comes into play. Uh, the rental number comes into play. Um, sometimes you know, people just don't want to carry on moving around around the town. They want to they, they want to have that age old security of, of owning that of owning a house and not feeling like they're living in a temporary housing. So, um, it really depends on the um, um, on those three a combination of those three things, um, and everyone has a different balance between them. Um, so, I don't know if you necessarily agreed with this, but there's something else that came from our call last week, which I thought was sort of interesting, because I'm trying to wrap all this up for the sake of being able to have podcast listeners understand, um, is that when you go to purchase a – of course, Rob drives a Range Rover. What else would you expect him to drive? A nice British gentleman. <laughs> so when you bought, went to buy your Range Rover, you didn't have the expectation that it was going to be worth more next year. You had the expectation that you were going to get your use out of it, and then four years or five years, whenever you decide to go to sell it, that you're going to sell it for less than you paid sometimes by half. Now, not suggesting that that's going to be that, you know, painful in, you know, some of these upper end markets like what Rob's in. But guys, guess what? That is what's happening in some parts of New York City. That is what's starting to happen in other parts of the country. That you're seeing these, you know, these assets basically lose half their value inside two or three years compared to when they bought them, you know, not so long ago. So well, you have to I, I always. You made a good point, actually. Because there's there's another couple of things that I was going to say. Our, our biggest buyer base, especially in you know in the young family um, demographic, is a really um, moving from Manhattan, and that that market was incredibly strong for um, for a long period of time, and in the last couple of years, not so. So um, some of some of these young families moving are, are potentially facing losing 20 percent. Um, 15 to 25 maybe would be the range on on a um, on selling their apartment if they bought it in the last uh, three five years, um, and they're looking to recoup that on their on their next purchase if they're if they're moving out to the suburbs. The other thing I was going to mention was um, sometimes a lot of times the conversation about buying um, buying a house will will be a choice between um, going down the high end new construction and um, and or buying um, an existing property and that is also an interesting conversation and it's not a local market it's not just a local market thing that's a national thing and that the price for new construction and material um, um, and materials has, has risen significantly so it, 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 it that comes into play as well if you're you, you've got someone that really would quite like to build their dream house but they they're realizing that they're the inventory on the market is going to make them out of pocket on day one and that makes them uncomfortable so they come back to buying the existing um inventory at a, at a discount rather than unless they really want to build their dream house and that happens too so and that's a very knowing 
um, financial decision for a lot of these buyers. They're not they're they're wealthy, sophisticated guys. Um, they know that they're potentially looking at that, and they still want to do it because um, they look at the real estate at that real estate as something that's a luxury item that they've always wanted to do, and they're and they're comfortable with it. Yeah, I mean it is fun sometimes, right? I mean to go through the whole process. You, most people want to go through it once and never again. But yeah, so <laughs> let's talk. I want to. Talk, I have two. Do you have another half hour, Rob? Do you have or do you have to go? No, I'm all yours. Okay, good. So um, I want to talk to you about sellers. So sellers on your in your world are losing money. You've had some sellers that not you had nothing to do with. You know, it's just the nature of the market who are losing millions yep. of dollars on their sales. But what's fascinating, and listeners, again, I'm, I'm just because I want to set this question up so Rob can be concise, is that when Rob has these conversations with the seller, because his market's been in a protracted down market for a long time, he is not having to convince them that the market is uh, that they're going to lose money. They know they're going to lose money. But what's odd is it's not even a concern most times of how much money they're going to lose. It's just a function of getting the house sold. And we did a series of podcasts on the phases of a real estate market, and what Rob is experiencing is the protracted buyer's market, or what we call phase three. If you guys have not listened to those podcasts, you must. <laughs> Just go to timandjulieharris.com or go to iTunes or go to Stitcher, and please do listen to those podcasts. So when you're talking to – you can just pick up right where I left it off. I mean, essentially, that's the normal conversation. You're talking with some of these – um, ultra net worth types, and they're not, they're not like, okay, well, I don't like losing millions of dollars, but that just is what the market is. Um, when, did that mark, when did it really shift in your market where sellers, uh, to your, use your elegant word, became knowing of the situation and you didn't have to wrestle with them anymore about price? Well, it's, I mean, it's a very slow shift, and not everybody is in that mindset. There are more people in that mindset um, than there used to be, but there are still you know, all sellers and I would, um, it, it, it's not, um, I think if, all, I think if all sellers are in that mindset, then I think that would create a distressed market and we're, um, and when, and we're not in that, um, we're not in that phase. And, and I think Greenwich is similar to other high end markets where, um, an owner can be very cognizant of the weakness in the market, but make, again, the same as the buyers, make knowing decisions that are non-financial. Um, an, an owner can be in that position as well, where uh, sometimes it can be wrapped up in their um, their ego in the house and what they have in it, and that's another topic. But um, they they can also they can also know that the market is getting weaker, and and I can help explain to them if it carries on it could be it, it could be less money in a in a year a two years can time you, if they don't sell that? It, can you let the listeners listen to what you tell them because you do such a masterful job at some of the things you say to these guys well if you're if you're facing if you if you meet the market today on where the market price is or you have the choice of meeting it in two years if we if we talk about where we think the market's going to go and you you're you're you have a four million dollar house and it's going to be worth uh, th potentially three and a half in a couple of years. Do you want to take that loss now, or do you want to kick the can down the road? Um, and some people will be happy kicking the can down the road, knowing that. Um, so it's not always. Um, not every seller wants to meet the market where the market is very quickly. Um, uh, more people do, and that's what creates. And that's what creates the market, and that's what uh, that's what's um, created a softening in prices. But I would say the way that the way that the buyers deal with that is it's it's interesting in the last couple of years you'll see i've seen a situation where if a seller isn't priced within 5 to 6% of their of where the eventual transaction is going to be wherever that is then you tend to get very few showings and zero offers as soon as you're within that zone you um you you may get a, a multiple interest, but until you've reduced into that, or if your initial listing price is that, um, or it's the fourth reduction, doesn't matter. You'll suddenly have um, you'll you'll suddenly the market will tell you very quickly what doesn't happen in this market, and this is sometimes um, difficult to describe effectively to sellers. Is what doesn't happen if you're if you're wrong, you'll get um, you'll get nothing, um, and and the effort that you put into future reductions. Are going to be um, are going to end mean you end up getting less money for your for your house because you're begging for people's attention by then, and you have to create much more value than you would have done at the initial listing price. 
So here's what's really fascinating, and I hope everyone's listening. Any agent who sells in any price range in any market, you know exactly what he's talking about. There's an, uh, we have this as part of our listing presentation. Um, there's an old it, – it's been around forever. Julian, I didn't create this. It's a, basically a target, and it shows exactly what he just said. Um, it's part of the a listing presentation. It's also part of the pre-listing pack, and it basically shows the seller – exactly what he just said. In essence, if you are just this far off and a single digits far off, you won't get any showings and that house will grow stale. And then, it, you know, the whole thing is just going to be a downward spiral. And that's what happens a lot of times when sellers just aren't willing to accept reality. Rob has become masterful at helping sellers understand that the time to sell is now not to try to, you know, essentially chase the market down, but also he's become incredibly effective at helping sellers that weren't successful with the, maybe their first two or three listing agents getting their property sold. And not always just because he needs to lower the price, but sometimes it's, well, a lot of times it's essentially how the house is being represented. But though I don't think Rob would ever admit this, one of the biggest reasons he's so successful selling his listings because he calls them the leads back right away. He chases every single transaction. He is a true grinder even at his level, he does not let the ball go by. I mean, I don't have to have conversations with Rob ever about being lazy or complacent. You know, and that's something all of you guys have to understand. The parallels uh, between selling ultra, ultra high net worth or, you know, ultra high expensive multi-million dollar, you know, properties. These are guys with their own jets. These are people with multiple houses all over the world. Those types of relationships the nature of the conversations and the you know all the whole thing, the scripting basically is the exact same. If you were selling mobile homes in the middle of nowhere, it's the same exact market dynamics, just on a and much it, broader make, scale. And that's that's when you're facing the client. It's also, I mean, I I think it's important as well to be known to be um, a very transactional agent with your agent with your broker community too. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a really um, good point, Rob. You do you do a great job at that. I mean, you're you're picking up expired listings all the time, and you know they're choosing you over other agents. Um, I'm so you, but you do maintain help, a really close software, relationship. Help, help brokers, yeah. Help help other agents um, um, have the confidence in you to know that you're going to be um, an effective and transactional agent when they show your house, and it, it'll make a difference. And that doesn't matter whether you're selling, where you're selling. Uh, that's just human nature. Well, I'm, I'm um, going to point something out. This, this, Rob, this is worth saying, okay? I don't know. You'll never say this, but I'm going to say it for you. So Rob has actually been, and many times, has actually given business. So he'll have, for example, he'll have a buyer call him, who the buyer he knows he's working with some other agent he knows. And he'll call up that other agent and let him know what's going on and tell that buyer that, you know, even if there's no buyer agency agreement, to work with that other agent. And as a result of him having this absolutely golden reputation in Greenwich, Connecticut, he has agents on a regular basis, even in his own market, sending him listings or listing opportunities for listings they have that are about to expire or listings that they have where they think he actually might have a better uh, shot at selling it uh, because of how he is. Maybe it's a waterfront property or maybe it's something that's truly – you know, ultra high end, and they just don't want to, you know, it's not something they're comfortable with. That comes from having really worked hard to have great relationships with the, uh, you know, the other agents in in his marketplace. And that's something that you better sure as heck do if you want to sell real estate in the ultra high ends. Now, if you're selling massive amounts of real estate, uh, you know, huge production agent, then those relationships can be more transactional. But in Rob's world, you better be almost on a friend, if not very close friend level with some of the top agents. Anything you want to tag on that? Yeah, you, you, it's, 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 a collab, it, it, it's a collaborative venture, which still means obviously doesn't get in the way of your fiduciary duty to your clients, but it's, um, it helps you become more effective as an agent. And that is something that you can talk to your clients about, but that will generally not even be on their um, radar of something that's important when they're choosing an agent. You can choose to tell them about it, and they may put weight into it, but I know – personally and, and 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 the guys that are on your show and and your clients on the coaching um um list will will know that it's in, it, it's important and it helps you it helps you get things um uh, it helps you get things done so when you run across a seller that's aspirationally priced or wanting to ask and we got that from diana ramirez by the way your broker she's awesome so when you come across a awesome. seller who's Yes, she is. When you come across a seller who's ask, wanting to aspirationally price, <laughs> um, and uh, in other words, they want to overprice the listing, and they're then trying to twist your arm. Uh, here's another little uh, paradigm shift for all of you guys. Very rarely does Rob have a truly motivated seller. 
because when you're dealing with folks in this level, there's there's just essentially they have if the money's not in one pocket, it's in another pocket, and they don't there's there's it sometimes it's just I'm ready to be done with it versus I have to sell this house because I need the money. You want to tag on anything with that because that's something that most people won't be able to relate to. Yeah, and I to. think that's a feature. I think that's a feature of a lot of high end markets where if you um, in a in a lot of markets across the country, a life event like a divorce um, or a death might um, might be a, a um, have to sell person. That's not necessarily the cases in the in the luxury market. So it's it's um, the rules are kind of the rules are slightly different. Um, people also are a little cagey sometimes about their motivation. They might actually um, have to sell, but they're not. Um, but they're that you know for they don't want it to be known. So it's it's um, I wouldn't say it's a game, but it's it, it you know people. Um, People sometimes take a take a while to uh, to talk about having to sell. They feel like it's an admission of defeat. Um, but the yeah, so it's a little yeah, different well, from other I mean, markets. They're sophisticated. They don't want you to know that they're more motivated because they don't want you to necessarily bring them some you know offer that might be lower than you otherwise would if you didn't think they're motivated. It's just you know semantics of negotiating with sellers. But with regards to – let's talk about you know, price, condition, location. Let's talk about marketing. You d- are in a world where um, there's a lot of pressure to spend a lot of stupid, unnecessary money on marketing that does virtually nothing to get property sold. These are all my words, not Rob. Um, but you do have that as a constant omnipresent threat where agents will try to basically outspend you on the marketing front. And fortunately, your brokerage does a fantastic job of marketing, and you've done just a brilliant job with this. I mean, what's your, uh, what's your website, Robert John- Johnson Greenwich? What is it? Rob Johnson Greenwich, yep. Yeah, you guys should check that um, out. Um, yeah, it's beautiful. Which I'm so, just getting redone at the moment. <laughs> so, yeah, but, well, yeah, of course, you've got to keep evolving, I mean, you know? So, so let's, talk, the, let's talk about the sellers that try to put the full court press on you to do the marketing when they're overpriced. I mean, we talked about this last week too, Rob, with regards to basically if a house isn't selling, why? Is it because of not enough marketing? Yeah, and sometimes the seller, the, you know, the, on the regular conversations you can have with a seller, it, it can be um, – it'll come up. You know, the showings are down um, or the house is still on the market. A go-to element for a seller tends to be – well, it must be that you're not reaching the a certain market um, with marketing, and it's about a dollar spend rather than rather than the price. So, um, it's always a tough conversation because you want to you want to reassure the the seller that you're doing as much as you possibly can, um, while telling them that at a certain point it really it, it's really more of a price thing or a condition uh, thing um, than a and a market. Um, rather than the um, rather than the amount of uh, dollar spend on on print advertising, so every situation is different, and every house requires a, a, a different amount of um, of coverage. Sometimes we might use uh, social media more. Sometimes it'll be more um, advertising in Manhattan. Um, it, it varies. Every there isn't like a there isn't a catch all on how much we spend and how much we do for each property, but. Um, it often, when those questions come up, they often really rev- should be revolving around price rather than um, dollar spent. Has a, have you ever had a listing not sell uh, because it was overpriced? The answer is obviously yes. Have you ever had a listing not sell because you didn't put it in the New York Times and advertise the crap out of it? The answer is no. And listeners, you guys ought to think about that because there's so much pressure on you to spend, frankly, all your money on marketing and advertising, um, which you're not realizing at the end of the day houses do or don't sell based on price, condition, and location. And sometimes all three of those things are a problem. But the only thing that can overcome those three things is price. So unless you learn how to the correct... Mo- I think that it goes back to the initial conversations as well. So if you're... Um, it's, it's the agent's fault if they're having very hard conversations in in um, X period of time after the listing about not selling the house, then they're, they're partly to blame and they have to own that because... The the one thing that you're giving um, an owner when you first meet them is meant to be um, a genuine um, idea, um, and this is one of the few things that they that they're meant to have a real insight into is where the market is for that house, and if that um, and that price might be different from where the owner wants to list it, and that's a conversation. But your the most valuable advice you can give an owner when you first meet them is where that where that price is going to be. Um, 
if the owner's desire to list it is um, is a lot different from that, then that's a conversation. It doesn't mean that the agent is going to not take the listing, but what's helpful is to go back to those original conversations when the subsequent conversations come up and say, this is where we, this is where we thought the market was going to be. Um, at your price point, this is the amount of showings and, um, and offers that you should be getting if you're within 5 or 6% of the price um, after we listed it. And if they're not there, the regular conversations about uh, repositioning should be kicking in before, um, in an ideal world, before an owner is calling you with basically um, an unhappy situation. So, listeners, here's what he said. I hopefully you heard all of this. That was really important. He's not turning sellers down because they won't list it at his price. If you ever lose a listing because they won't list it at your price, you're making a mistake. Because guess what, guys? You can be wrong. And if you're selling stuff like what Rob's selling, those are not production houses. Well, most of them. They're talking about something that's truly unique. And there could be some sort of you don't know one in 100 buyers that's willing to pay what your CMA told you would be a ridiculous price or at least over, you know, over what it should have been listed at. And, you know, guess what? You can be wrong. happens all the time. Yeah. But the more, some some but houses the, are a lot easier yeah. to price than others, but, yeah. Yeah. So the moral of the story, guys, is you heard what he said. You can take the listing above what your CMA suggested it should be, knowing that you could be wrong. Don't dig your heels in and ruin your relationship with that seller, let alone not take the listing, because you thought it was your you know, moral prerogative or moral imperative, rather, to take the listing at what you thought was the right price. That's just your ego screwing you out of a transaction helping somebody. Okay? So Rob does occasionally take things that are above what he thought they maybe should be priced at, and occasionally he was, he's surprised on the upside. Most of the time he's not. But what he does then enable the seller to do is they can have then essentially, you know, they'll have gotten an opportunity to see what doesn't happen at that elevated price, and then they're going to be more open to listening to what Rob was saying as far as price goes. That is going to happen be, all the time. Yeah, but yes, just sorry. be very clear at the – sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, the, no. be, just be very clear at the outset with your client what your – what that um, what your thoughts are on it because um, a lot of times agents don't do that because they just want to play into the, where, the, where they know the seller really wants to list and I, I think that's a it's a big mistake. You mean asking the seller what the, where the seller wants to list it and just list it at the seller's price? I, yeah, that totally being, is a big mistake. Being scared, yeah, being 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 scared to give um, their honest opinion. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't. You can have a difference of opinion on price and still work with a client, and in the long run, they're going to respect you for for, for that. Um, How do you tell them that, Rob? You, I mean, you're, you, you've said that twice now, and I think that the listeners are, that are paying attention are going to know. How do you tell a seller that you're not in alignment with them on price, and you're going to try it at their opinion of price, knowing that there's going to be a conversation that's going to happen in the near future about repositioning? And hopefully, listeners, you're paying attention to the words we're using. Never say lower the price. Always say reposition the house on the market to correctly reflect the buyer's expectation or it, you know, a version of that. Okay? So how do you, how do you essentially have that um, real conversation where you're going to take it over what you perceive to be the market um, and yet not piss the seller off? Well, you, the background that you give them when you meet them on um, what's transacted in your market, um, you know, what's actually closed. Because a lot of times sellers in this, in this market will say, well, look at all these other listings. We're better than this, this, and this. And I said, well, they're the ones that are active, and they're your competition, and they haven't mm. sold. So you start off with the closed listings, and then you go through your competition, which brings you to, you know, if you're, if you're in a very cramped um, niche in that market, you can go through – um, the amount of months that are um, of supply that's there with that um, with that current inventory, and do you want to be, you know, do you want to be in the middle of that or or on the upper end of that? Because guess what, you're not going to sell. You're going to have to, you're not going to sell if you're in that spot. Like it's back to our five to six percent um, equation. Buyers in soft markets will. They're looking, um, and there's money, and that's why it's not distressed. There's a plenty of money that's looking to buy some of these assets, but they have to feel like they're getting a deal. So they're not going to engage on you if you're in that outer space. If you're the best one, two, or three things in your little price point in your location, you're going you're gonna to have people interested. And do you want to be one of those, or do you want to be – do you want to play a longer game for the other reasons that we talked about? So it's not um, – it's not about 
criticizing their property. It's about being very straight with the information um, and then doing with that information what is best for the client. So in a market like Greenwich, Connecticut, in, in a really challenging market that was, you know, you had to learn to be as successful as, you know, I'm not going to say it's fast because you've been doing this forever, but to go from an agent that was, uh, a, you know, look, dude, you've climbed the mountain and you've done it relatively quick by anyone's measure. I'm not going to really, I don't know if any way else no, I, way to I, say I, that. You, no, well, I know you're humble and I don't want to have you correct me a million times because I'm trying to give you a compliment. So I'm trying to dance around your natural <laughs> tendencies not to take a compliment, Rob. This is not easy for me. But I'm going to say it, okay? So you have gone from essentially a, a successful person. We, you know, you've been successful in life in general. Um, but in real estate, you've gone in a relatively short period of time, going from who's Rob Johnson to now what I'll say, because, again, I know you won't, the number one agent in Greenwich, Connecticut, let alone the entire state of Connecticut um, by volume, and probably one of the most successful agents in the United States, if not the entire world. Okay, there's something you'll never say, those two things together. Well, that's, that's definitely not true, but uh, thank you. Um, the, <laughs> well, and, how would you know it's the, not true? Uh, how, I mean, it is true, Rob. There's plenty, Look at the list. There's plenty of people, Eight, there's plenty of people that, sell, that sell more than me. But the, see, guys, um, didn't I tell you he's going to fight me on the compliment? That's, you know, it's, cause he's, it, it's, it's real humility because he's appreciating the position he's finding himself in, but he's also walking on my question and my compliment, which is very rude, especially for a British gentleman. I need to point that out, okay? <laughs> please, co please continue. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay, so with regards to your success, what would be three things that if you could tell the Rob, Robert Johnson from you know four or five years ago, three things that you wish you would have known, or maybe you knew but you really didn't want to accept, what would those things be? God, I, that's a good question. Um, wow, what a reaction. That I, was a good question. I, the Well, I knew that I I knew that um being full-time and and putting and putting the time in to get um to get the knowledge in your job. I knew that from the beginning. So that that wasn't a surprise and and I think that's important for any agent no matter what market they're in. Uh, I think you have to show that you're that you're um that you're fully committed and not a part-time agent. Um but that was that was a presumption that I had going in. Things that I've learned um, since is your question. Um, geez. Um, you wish you would have known. The, the the collaboration with other agents was one thing that I didn't think was as important as it as it has been. Um, I think um, the the amount. This, the the effect of sphere of influence um, and managing that, staying on top of it, and and the amount of business that I get from referrals from past clients um, and senses of influence is has been huge for me, and I and I probably would have worked on that harder from the from the get go. Um, I know you and I argue about expires all the time, so I won't even bring that up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you mean you wish you would have focused more on expires? This is your confessional. Yes, I agree completely. You should have focused more on expires. Keep moving on. Let's move on. Um, <laughs> the, um, <laughs> the, those are the first couple of things that spring to mind. I, I, uh, yeah, you kind of sprung that one on me. So um, I know. Well, yeah. listeners, you're yeah. hearing, you're hearing, but you're hearing that he essentially has the same struggles that, that you guys do. You know, even as successful as he is, he still doesn't necessarily want to, you know, call the FISBOs and the expireds, which, you know, in that market. It's really rate, hard. It, it, <laughs> it's a constant conversation, and Tim's laughing because he knows what I really want to say here. It, it's very hard for me to do that. So um, there are certain things that, you know, may, maybe if I look back on it, maybe getting comfortable with that from the beginning might have been, might have been more productive. I don't know. Maybe, uh, but it, there are. There are certain struggles that are the same in every market. You're right. Um, centers of influence and past clients. What do you do to work them now? What is what is it? Your just give them a snapshot of what you and Lisa have created for a 12 month plan to focus on those guys. Uh, client appreciation events. Doing doing those regularly. Reaching out to people if everything's okay. Do they need any recommendations uh, for calling. anything? So, hmm? right. You're calling. calling. You're picking up the phone. You're calling. Yeah. Um, Staying in staying in contact with those people. I've experimented with a bunch of different um, systems to do that, and I haven't got a great 
answer on what's best, but um, sometimes just if I'm in my car, just scrolling through my contacts from A to A to Z, and and going through those and looking at names that I haven't called, and just there are there are lots of times in the day that you can choose to um, that you can fit a couple of those calls in. Uh, you don't have to be sat at your desk and and concentrating on it. You could just it just becomes a habit, which is it. It's nice. It's a good. It's a good casual way to keep in touch with people. Um, and also, you're involved in. We won't necessarily list, rattle off all the places, but you're actively involved in the community. You're involved in different social clubs. You're involved in. Um, and, and when you're in those environments, you do. Though you're not like overly aggressive, you definitely let people know that you're here to help. How do you do that? So when you're at, you know, just pick your event and some polo field around a bunch of. Polo playing friends of yours. How Just do you the go usual about... polo on a Monday. Yeah, we need to exactly. wrap this up. Exactly, the usual polo, polo on a Monday while having, so, while, yeah, while having yeah, martinis. Yeah, right. yeah, while you're flipping through your private jet catalogs. <laughs> yeah, with your feet up on the back seat of your Bentley. <laughs> no, but seriously, how do you go about asking people or letting them know that you're interested in helping them? I think just being it, – it's not an overt – thing for me it's more um it's it's more of a um a contact thing and and um i think sometimes i describe if if you go to a a party a christmas party or a birthday party i always tease i've got a couple of friends that are surgeons and and we always joke that someone's going to hit up uh, my friends that are surgeons about uh about advice on their hip when they're really a shoulder doctor and um the same thing they're going to come and ask an an agent about real estate so it's uh my my variation is it didn't take eight years of training and and um um, but it's the same thing people want to talk about um about real estate and what's going on in their neighborhood it doesn't matter whether their house is worth a hundred thousand or 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 50 million so it's not um it's not a difficult thing to introduce i love talking about it i love what i do and people want to ask questions so it's it's kind of a it's just it just happens well so it just happens because you invite the conversation whereas a lot of agents rob they'll be in a group of people and they'll be the secret agent they won't say anything they won't bring up real estate because their minds are all of a flutter of all these ego-based thoughts where you encourage conversations you're not necessarily jumping down people's throats but the flip side to it is you're not hiding your willingness to talk with them about real estate especially with their sons of influence and past clients and hopefully listeners you are listening he does do his private, you know, his his uh, client appreciation events and all the rest of it. But he's he's picking up the phone. He makes he grinds out uh, contacts, not on a regular basis or as many as he probably should be doing. But it's hard to criticize a guy that's you know selling 150 million dollars this a year, or whatever you're going to close this year. So Rob, one last question. Well, this one this yes. one's totally self-serving. Ready? Okay. So coaching. Why has coaching been important to you? The I would say. Every week, I mean, we pretty much, barring the odd exception, we speak every Wednesday at, at 11 o'clock. And um, the amount of ideas, um, and it changes from week to week what I get out of the uh, conversation. Sometimes it's you, and you, you're very good at picking up on this. That's why you're good at what you do, is that you you know which buttons to press. So some weeks you know that uh, you're going to be kicking my ass and forcing me to do something out of my comfort zone. And then the next week is more spitballing with some ideas about marketing or a website. So it, it's constantly changing, but having that regular um, regular date on the calendar which i'll i'll move um everything to to have for that half an hour um has been really invaluable uh to me i mean you your your contacts across the country have been helpful you've 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 put me in touch with people in um everywhere from philly to the city to new york to la um you've helped me with all sorts of um a, a very diverse amount of things in 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 my uh, job and just when you think it's it's going to be a regular conversation it turns into something else so um there isn't a one catch all that you've helped me with it's been across multiple different areas and mr johnson truly it's been an honor and i hope for many years to come and it was to great coach. to meet you a few, yeah it, yeah when we were like in new york year, five, five <laughs> years to to grab a coffee <laughs> Yeah, well, it's your fault, not mine. I've invited you out a million times, and you better, you better sorry, come I didn't down come to, to Texas. You, well, I kind of understand, but you have no excuse not to fly down to visit us at the lovely Ritz Carlton Dorado Beach where we're living now. So make sure you come down and visit us towards the end of this year. But Rob, honestly, you've been one of the, my favorite coaching clients just because, and here's the main reason why: 
you have no freaking ego. At least you don't bring it out on the, on the coaching calls. You do not fight me. I know you're not always doing what we're talking about. Duh, that's just called normal. But that's the greatest <laughs> thing about you is, is the humility. Well, it, I know. You write things down, and I know where it goes, in your desk drawer. But the reality of it is, is that's the reason that I think ultimately, Rob, that you have been and will continue to be so preferred by the sellers in your marketplace is because you have this undefinable quality that is humility, but it's also confidence. So you, you have uh, earned this place in the real estate you know, world of you – know, you don't like my, you, my compliments or my labels for you, but they're accurate. You know, and I appreciate the fact that you want to toss them off because personally, I feel like this, that's the same way when Julie, when people are trying to pour it on for us. I don't particularly like it either because, you know, you're on a mission. You're you're here to really make the best version of you, but also you're doing this for the sake of. You don't have a big why. You know, there's no. Well, here's the, that's a silly question that I've never in a million years asked, but I know you're exposed to this type of hippie thinking all the time. Do you have a big why? Do you Constantly. believe in the big why? What is the big one? I don't even know. What the yeah, there you go. Means. It's a dumb question. I'm sorry for asking it. That's embarrassing. What a what a fool of me to you ask mean, that. You mean why question. why do we, you mean why do we do what we do? <laughs> yeah, for freaking money. Isn't that the obvious answer? You're not. I mean, yeah, I like I like to pay the bills. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's the big one. Sorry, it's not very so deep. <laughs> Rob, there's going to be someone or somebody's over the years that are going to listen to this, and they're going to be amazingly appreciative of the time you spent on this podcast the past hour. If they want to send you a referral, um, and I'm going to ask you to do something, and if you don't want to do it, I won't grind you on it, but I would strongly suggest you share your cell phone number. And if you do, listeners, here's the thing. Do not call him, text him. That way, because he's, this guy is busier than just you can possibly imagine. So if you're going and to I will definitely it, come if, back to you. But so, yeah, 203-979-2360. Or you can email me at robjohnson at halstead.com. That's H-A-L-S-T-E-A-D. So this podcast is going to go to people in New York City. It's going to go to people in L.A. A lot of you guys are going to have clients. That you're going to, you know, Philadelphia, the main line, uh, down in Miami, foreign countries, everywhere around the world. So if you have any referrals that might even be interested in New York City and you're looking for a great connection, Rob has got some of the best agents in New York City, and he and those agents exchange referrals all the time. So just connect with them and try to do business with them. And if you are, you're going to be as grateful as I am to have them in your life. So Rob Johnson, I sincerely appreciate you being my guest today and listeners. There you go. Told you it was going to be cool. <laughs> thank, hey, Rob, thank you, Tim. Fantastic and day. I, I appreciate your uh, your time as well, and you're always very generous with your praise. So much appreciated, and um, I'll speak to you soon. Thank you, sir. God bless everyone. Bye. Bye. This program has been a presentation by Tim and Julie Harris Real Estate Coaching. For more information on our real estate coaching and training programs, visit our website at timandjulieharris.com. Remember to tune in weekdays at noon for upcoming shows. And until next time, thank you for listening to Real Estate Coaching Radio with Tim and Julie Harris.